Well, business news now, and the European Union has eased off its plans to ban Russian oil from the global market, dropping plans to bar Russian cargo ships from the global insurance market. The move comes as crude oil prices fall sharply from the highs reached after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, EU nations are growing increasingly concerned about an energy crunch as the Ukraine war grinds on. And the UK, home to the world's biggest insurance market, has been slow to agree terms with the EU. For the story and the rest of the day's business headlines, I'm joined by Arise business correspondent Laurie Laird, who's monitoring developments from London. Lovely to see you, Laurie. Uh, a big climb down for the EU. What's going on there? Absolutely. And this really, this climb down came in, in so much secrecy. It's only the Financial Times that's reporting this story, but the Financial Times is a reputable source and the, the, they have included quotes from anonymous, unnamed EU officials. So I think that we can assume that this story is in fact correct. But the EU, you'll remember two months ago with great fanfare, banned all exports of Russian crude oil. And the way they did this is they were going to try and group together to prevent all of those cargo ships from being insured without insurance. There's no way that anyone was going to take that crude and, and send it to a third country. But a couple of things seem to have gone wrong. E the EU slightly seems to be blaming the UK. The UK hadn't quite agreed terms with the EU. Without the, e the UK on this, there is absolutely no preventing insurers from getting in there. Lord the Lloyd's insurance market in the center of the city of London is the biggest maritime insurance center in the world by far. Without London, there's simply no way that you could enforce any kind of ban on insurance. But there's also something else going on here. It really feels very much like the EU is very concerned about a, a fuel crunch come winter. Now, we're talking about oil now, not gas. We've spoken quite a bit about gas and the worries about a gas shortage when the, the weather turns colder in Europe. But Europe is also concerned about a crude oil shortage as well, as is the U.S. And I think that's why we're not hearing all that much official outcry about the fact that this deal hasn't gone through. I mean, one is reminded of sort of Brexit when we hear of this blame game between the EU Absolutely. and the UK. But I was just wondering, Laurie, I mean, won't this give Vladimir Putin more money to finance the war in Ukraine? Absolutely. And you make two very good points there, Charles. Very quickly, if we can talk about this battle between the UK and the EU, it is a battle that is ongoing. Boris Johnson, the outgoing prime minister, has said so many times, I was elected to get Brexit done. I got Brexit done. Brexit is not done, not by a long way. And one of the things that the EU and the UK are fighting about right now are regulations and standards for financial services. They cannot agree terms. There are a couple of battles going on. So I, I'm not entirely surprised that the two sides could not come to, to terms over an insurance deal. Uh, but also you ask about Vladimir Putin, will this finance his war machine? Absolutely, without a doubt. And the feeling has always been that Vladimir Putin can afford to play some games with gas supply to Europe. Gas only takes up about 2% of Russian GDP, where crude oil is closer to 10% of GDP. So losing oil exports is much, much more important to Vladimir Putin than losing gas exports. And uh, obviously, Laurie, the market's a key gauge in all of this. How have oil prices reacted? Day, Charles, we're down about 4%. That takes Brent crude below $100 a barrel. And, it re and, and while that is an awful lot of money, remember at the start of the war, there was all sorts of ap apocalyptic talk about oil prices going to $200 a barrel, $230 a barrel. That hasn't come anywhere close to happening. We we maxed out at about $130 a barrel just at the, at the beginning of March, hovered around there for a bit, and now we have been steadily coming down. This isn't the first time that crude oil has traded below $100 a barrel uh, over the past couple of weeks. In fact, the fears of recession across the world are dampening oil prices quite a bit. That may do more for oil prices than any kind of wrangling between the EU and Russia about whether Russia can sell its oil. 
Well, let's broaden things out a bit, uh, Laurie. Um, we've had a slew of manufacturing data out today. Lots of numbers have been published uh, covering economies across the globe. What do these data tell us? These are these are what's called purchasing manage, uh, managers data, Charles, and they come out in the first working day of the month. And because they come out so very early, they are a real benchmark for traders. It's the first glimpse at how any individual economy is doing. Most of these data are compiled by the same data source. So we do see every country releasing its purchasing management index on the first day of the month. Now, I, I, I want to put a caveat in front of these numbers before we talk about exactly what they mean. These are, while these measure the sentiment in the manufacturing industries across the world, these numbers do not count how many widgets or cars or uh, automobiles or washing machines. They don't count how many things were manufactured in a given economy. These indices are created by surveying purchasing managers at manufacturing companies and asking them, what is your outlook? Are things getting better or are things looking worse? And if more than 50% of purchasing managers say things are looking better, that gives you a reading over 50. Anything over 50 means expansion. Anything under 50 means contraction. So while these are very, very closely watched data, they don't necessarily measure things that have been built in the way that official data do. That said, the market takes them very, very seriously. Uh, and let's let's go over a summary. Uh, China did very poorly. The, the the measure from manufacturing in China fell into fell below that make or break 50 level. That means contraction, Japan as well. So the two biggest manufacturing economies in Asia are contracting, at least according to these data. Europe also did very poorly. Germany, France, Italy, and Spain all suffered contractions. And, and, and if we want to add insult to injury, if we're going to look at Germany, which is worth looking at, it's the biggest European economy. Some uh, other staggeringly bad news out of Germany today, retail sales fell by almost 9% year on year in the month of July. That's the biggest fall, Charles, since records began. Consumption isn't as much of a, it's not such a big factor in the German economy the way it is in the US economy or the UK economy, but that does tell you that consumer sentiment in Germany is looking very, very shaky. Manufacturing did fall a little bit in the US, but it's still, uh, it's still expanding just at a slower rate than it was. Well, I mean, broadly speaking, it all looks rather grim. Laurie, thanks very much it, yes. indeed. Uh